My name is Paula Shaw. I've been a professional actress for over 50 years. When I uh, got done with high school, I got scholarships uh, to Bard College, upstate New York. And it was an incredible education. And I was a drama major. And then when I came out, uh, I went to Manhattan. I did theater in Manhattan, did off-Broadway, off-off-Broadway, started to do understudy off-Broadway. And then I got into a show that came to Los Angeles. And while I was in L.A., uh, I also got into an improv theater group, uh, theater group called Synergy Trust, which is where I learned improvisational theater games, which later I would teach. I, I also became a, a lifetime member of the Actor Studio, Lee Strasberg's Actor Studio, where I was a moderator. Uh, I did a lot of work there. I did writing and acting. Some friends of mine had taken the S training and said, go, don't just go. And oh my God, I would say whatever transformation is, that's what it was for me. I volunteered for a few years. I was leading their postgraduate seminars. A colleague of mine, I was in LA from New York, another graduate seminar leader, invented a course called The Mastery. Started in New York for actors and artists, choreographers, dancers, and he brought it to Los Angeles. I caught on right away and I started leading them. A gal from, uh, uh, from uh, the Netherlands who was at Esalen working in cabins as supervisor, she calls me and she says, Oh, Paul, I was given your name by New York. Uh, this is Sophia Schweitzer. I took this mastery in uh, Findhorn. They came from England, because it was an actors' institute in England. They came from Indian, England to lead the mastery in Findhorn. She says, Oh, it shook the place up. She says, Now I'm, I'm at Esalen and uh, uh, they need this course. Too much massage. So she invited me, she set up with another uh, fellow here, the first mastery in February of 1988. Well, they went nuts here. First of all, not used to doing workshops till four or five in the morning, which is what we did at that time. Sitting in chairs like theater style with pens and pads underneath. You had to come on time and follow ground rules. Whoa, they gave you a hard time. And uh, they said, you look like you're in a uniform, right? In my little sweater over my shoulder and my little go-go boots. And I said, I look like I'm in uniform. Have you looked at yourselves? It's 1988. Most of you look like it's 1963 in your Birkenstocks and your tie-dyes. When is the last time you went shopping? They had such a grand time and it caught on here and pretty soon all the staff was taking it and over the first two years I did 10 of them, I think. And people who were in other courses say, what are they doing? I want to do it. What are they doing? So I devised and I adjusted meanwhile I had made my own adjustments anyway and it became the max and it was now over a five-day course. And ever since then, some people call it, a, a, it's called an outlier. The problem child of Esalen. It's a very edgy workshop, you know, and it's very um, kind of an intrusive, intense workshop uh, to, for people really to turn themselves inside out in a way. Um, and it's not for everyone. I mean, the purpose of it is to broaden your experience of yourself, to stretch the container um, everything, your beliefs, your what happens to you, what you perceive, what you feel, what you, uh, what you hear, right? It's everything you experience. And this is an opportunity to enlarge that experience of yourself. So when I say turn yourself inside out, there's a lot that we keep inside that starts very early for most of us. Because, you know, if you look at kids, Kids are, for the most part, very expressive. They yell, they scream, they cry, they say whatever they feel, they like to play, they like to pretend, uh, they get mad, they cry easily. They, and it's not about being that again, but it's that kind of freedom, that kind of spontaneity that often we lose early on because we're shut down by experiences that hurt, by people that can't stand that kind of intensity that children have and try to get them to shut up and be quiet and behave. 
So this is about going into those places where we've shut down. And by the way, they exist in our bodies. Right? When we shut down, as we shut down, they're held inside of our, they're finding out our cells, our muscles, our, our bones, our joints. Um, and, and that's where they sit. Right? We, we're taught to swallow things, feelings, reactions, truths, expression, things that others may be threatened by. So it was really originally about unblocking yourself so that you would be able to be freer and more creative. Um, so this is about stretching to the max, pressing those limits out again so that you are be, you're able to be fully expressive and use that creativity in however you wish, in whatever arena of life you wish to use it. That those things that hold you back, they run you. When I look at people's eyes, you often f find out their eyes are not sparkling in the present. They seem to be clouded, like they're, they're somewhere else. I call it not being absent. I call it being present elsewhere. Getting here involves finding out what's in the way of your being here, what I call the system. And that's the accumulated pile of things that shut you down a long time ago, usually. What are you pre preoccupied with all the time that keeps you from being open, being available in the moment to what shows up, the possibilities of life, the spontaneity of life, the connection available at any given moment with people, the communication available back and forth. Are you a good listener? Can you not listen because sometimes people talk about things that it reminds you of stuff that takes you right away and you start thinking while somebody's talking to you about something else and you don't even know. You're not even aware that that's where you went off to. You think you're here, but you're not. And in the max, people become much more aware of what's going on moment to moment to moment. Where are you? There's all of it in there. Every experience that people have, love and anger and betrayal and grief and loss and fear and humor. Of course, that's, uh, there's always a lot of humor in what we do as well as the tears. So it's not, um, uh, it's not all deeply serious, although a lot of it is. What is the truth in this moment about anything is what it is, you know? And if you take responsibility for that, tell the truth about it, you know, uh, then you own it. And out of that, out of the truth, you, you, now you can make up stuff. You can't start from what's not true and create on top of that. Most people, like, before they know where they are, they're trying to change it. Well, it's best to know where you are first. I see the real stuff, you know, that people carry with them. I mean, I've heard stories that would curl your hair of what the kind of abuse people have suffered the kind of things that people have survived, you know? And then I get to see people liberate themselves from those experiences and find new life. I think the Course keeps growing in power. I've said, I used to use a hatchet, now it's a laser. I said, I don't do any B and E's, which are break and enter. I don't have to, it's all in the body. When you start to breathe into those sensations, a tightness here, a shivering there, right? A fluttering there, breathe into it. All that stuff that's been sitting inside starts to come up. You don't have to address it if you don't want to. It won't matter because someone else will get up and they'll have your issue and they'll have a very similar, you know, history. And you can go through the eye of the needle with them. You don't have to do all the work yourself. That's what part of what makes it so powerful. And you're all supporting each other, or holding each other on for dear life through a lot of tears and a lot of laughter and falling in love with people.
as they reveal themselves, people fall in love with each other in the max. And of course, that, that generalizes outside once you're done. I am a, pretty much of a truth teller and expresser and try not to hold things in or they're really bothering me. Um, you know, I have good friends. Uh, I have people I love. And I have a cat that I adore. There's nothing like looking into the eyes of an animal. In this case, my cat. My mind stops when I look into the eyes of my cat. My cat looks at me. I love that being so much. So I have, even though I don't have a companion in my life, and you know what I miss? That I don't, but I don't. That cat is my companion. My little girl, which I didn't, don't think I got to be when I was little. I think I wanted to be grown up right away. I think it was puff little girl. But I think that I am a little girl, a lot. There's a little girl right there. And I think that's what keeps me going and keeps me uh, healthful and young.